I love my parents from the bottom of my heart. However, they're quite strange, particularly a trait of my dad's. He hates sharing any information about himself. In fact, growing up, my friends thought he was a CIA agent. He'd stand at cross country and track meets in this long black trench coat, quietly, silently through the whole meets. And at parties, he'd leave early to write mathematical proofs in the basement. Well, being reserved and mysterious garners a middle-aged man the reputation of James Bond, or the most interesting man in the universe. But over the course of the period, I realized I inherited or caught this trait of my dad. And it manifested in me by the time I was a teen. And for a teenage girl, being reserved doesn't give you the label of mysterious or interesting but rather just plain weird. Fortunately, I was bookended by cool siblings, which allowed me to do what I love doing, and that's observe people. And while it's taken me a windy route to get back to it, over the past five years in Houston, that's exactly what I've been doing. My day job is to look at your cells and molecules. And at night, I study your data. And from my vantage of seeing you from the inside out, I want to share five things I've learned about you. The first is that this isn't cell, this is your internal cell, and these are your brain cells. So the first is you too are weird. In fact, a trillion of these amoeba like creatures course through your body at any given time. So you're immensely complex, and you're obviously beautiful from the inside out, and you're uniquely you. So your data is part of that complexity. Unfortunately, headline news would have us believe that we're all one giant humanoid. And examples of these are recent headlines. Vitamin E might ward off Alzheimer's, or drinking coffee prolongs life. They're treating us as one uniform human. In reality, it's much more nuanced. Vitamin E might work for somebody at some time in their life or coffee might be good for you but not your neighbor, or in one time in your life. But media, like us, like simple solutions, and so do scientists. We want one gene to cure cancers, one behavior to prolong lives. Well, when you start to think of human cells, you realize those simple solutions are rare. In fact, you can think of a cell as an adaptive robot. We model cells that way in the lab. And these robots are programmed by millions and millions of proteins. And these cells can adapt, they can interact with their neighbors, they can grow and divide. We know that there are many ways to program a computer. And we know there's many ways to corrupt it by viruses. So the holy grail for understanding our cells, when we have trillions of them, is not likely to be one simple solution. In fact, if you look at your data in more detail, you might find that the complexity is a key to your health. This is a data set from MD Anderson Cancer Center on just a handful of patient cancer cells. And this small subset of data shows you this type of complexity we're dealing with. And so the holy grail for us is not identifying one molecule, but understanding the code of life through how molecules interact and how they can program cell behavior. My lab realized this was the key to health when we started working with a clinician over at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Steve Kornblau. And we took this data and we started to make it into a map. In fact, we mapped out this data like you might map out stars in the galaxy. And we identified different interactions through proteins that tell us something about cells or whether a patient might have cancer or another disease. And this map allows us to see constellations which are unique to individuals. And I've told you two things now about yourselves from inside out. But when you compound this complexity with what you're doing on a regular basis, you realize it's magnitudes of order more. Every day, you're experimenting with yourself. What you eat for breakfast, how you're sitting right now, what time you go to bed, what you're drinking. All of these are an experiment. And we're recording much of it. 60% of us are recording things from our Fitbits or our cell phone data. But often we're recording the stimulation or what we're doing. We're rarely recording the response and how we feel. 
It was actually my response or how I felt, which was key to me understanding my health data a little bit more. So back in 2010, I started to record my health data, but also my response, like stress levels, which I found was very indicative of my weight. And when I looked in that data a little bit more closely, I recognized that in 2011 and 2010, every other time I saw an individual, I would start to see auras. And I don't mean the fuzzy halo of light over somebody's head like you might see in Berkeley. I was in Houston. Uh, I mean an aura with a migraine headache. And I rarely got headaches. So this was something that pinpointed to me a change that needed to be seen. And unless I had the wisdom to share on my data set, that information would have been lost. And so as we're recording this information, we have to realize that we know our data best. We're not always willing to share it. As an example, that same weight data that I shared with you, it's kind of hard to share weight, even though it's something that's fairly obvious, right? What I shared with the doctors looked more like this. In, in fact, every year before I went up for my physical, I would treat it like I was going for a wedding or a wrestling match or a gymnastics meet. Whatever I was doing the year before, I would diet and exercise to make sure that my physical was impersonal and very, very quick. I didn't want to share data. I didn't want to share information about myself. That mindset, that privacy-hungry data mindset, is changing. 68% of us are willing to share health data for research purposes. And 78% of us who are tracking ourselves are willing to share that data. But there's another interesting component about that. Three quarters of us want to own our own data. But as our data becomes more and more complex, it's very challenging for us to interpret our own data. So in fact, my lab saw the foresight in understanding that this complexity had to be solved in a quick way for every individual to start to deal with their health data. And we do this through harnessing the human visual system. We're the best pattern recognizing machines available currently, our visual system is. And so we can harness that by allowing us to see data not in the form that I'm showing you right now, but in a form where we can start to pick out patterns easily by our eyes. And so technologies that have been launched out of my lab into a startup company are starting to do that. So if you've been tracking your health data, your sleep and your weight and your miles run over the course of the last six months, you might be able to quickly see patterns and you might be able to identify in the last 30 days you were particularly stressed out because that crazy dad was visiting you or you were watching the presidential debates and glued to your seat and not eating and not sleeping. But that's your data and you can start to harness it in a way which impacts your health. The last thing I'd like to close on is one thing I've learned not just from the lab but from my life over the, over the past five years and that's that you change people. We're constantly told that you can't change someone unless they want to change themselves, but you're literally changing everyone you're talking with every time you're meeting with them. You're changing proteins in their cells. Compounds are being metabolized differently when they're talking with you. Neurotransmitters are firing differently between their brain cells in order to keep up the conversation. That aura that I mentioned, that could be caused by a flood of brain cells of immune cells through my brain. And when you think of that, compound that with every interaction you have with every other individual. Imagine if we started to treat our interactions with other people as a nutrient for us and as a drug for them. And so I'd like to close on that and thank you and share one last time the five things I've learned about you. One, you're just as complex and as weird as I am. You're also intricately beautiful from the inside out. Two, you, that beauty and complexity of you inside can be turned around to improve your health. Three, each one of you is an experiment. Four, you have wisdom to share. And five, you change everyone you encounter. Thank you.